Are you looking for your next watercolor palette? You want to level up quality of color selection, and maybe you've been searching endlessly on Amazon reading reviews, looking up pigment numbers, and you're left scratching your head. Does this sound familiar? Well, I'm here to walk you through the jungle that is searching for your level up watercolor palette on Amazon. Things actually get a little bit easier when you're shopping amidst the super duper fancy watercolor brands. You know, the ones they are made from like a billions year old recipe and you're kind of just splitting hairs at that point when it comes to quality. It's a lot about preference. But at the mid range watercolor level, things are really overwhelming. You can indeed paint with what I would closely call professional artist quality pigments and paint formulations at this mid-range level if you make the right choice. There are a few palettes in the review upcoming that come really, really close to some of my favorite uber duber super queen of them all paint brands. And that's pretty exciting because you won't have to spend nearly as much to get very, very similar results. But in this mid-range category, as I am self-naming it, there's a lot of selection and you have to wade through a lot of creative picker bushes and fog, if you will, to get to the gold. But that, my friends, is why I'm here. My obsession is for your gain. At least that's what I tell my husband. <laughs> So many palettes look the same or contain really similar colors. Honestly, some palettes are made by the same manufacturers, but don't tell you that. Maybe all the talk of light fastness has you worried you'll waste your money on paint that will fade soon. Maybe you dread learning to mix colors and wonder if you have to learn to mix colors. And maybe you just want to go for the biggest palette because it looks cool. I'm here to help you straighten it all out and have some pretty wild opinions along the way. But I will tell you this. It won't be from a super duper scientific pigment expert point of view. Sure, my 25 plus years as a professional artist allow me to claim the title expert, but my passion and joy and therefore the life and heartbeat of my work doesn't come from getting deeply technical all the time. There are plenty of folks out there that are really, really good at that. I'm coming to this watercolor palette review with a few personal caveats, perspectives, and personal health beliefs that I think you should know about. Number one, I want you to choose the new watercolor palette asking yourself this one question. Actually, two questions. How does your current palette make you feel when you paint with it? Certain frustrations, certain things that you actually like that are exciting, that you want more of. And number two, A, B to that question. <laughs> How do you want this new palette to make you feel? Like what gaps do you want it to fill? Really important. Okay, number two, I believe in using the colors, the pigment combinations in your paint formulation that you really love. Get ready for it, regardless of light fastness. There are so many ways to protect your paintings really well so that light fastness really doesn't have to be a huge worry. Please stick with me, don't click off, I trust me, trust me. Number three, watercolor has many faces and personalities. It's not just about sheer explosive pigment formulations. There's so much more to watercolor and I get really excited about that. So when I make my recommendations, that's gonna be something I'm thinking about. Number four, I am not a paint pigment scientist. I'm not even a color formulation nerd. I am someone that has been collecting for decades. I have an experienced knowledge of paint makeup. I have an intense working knowledge of a vast amount of palettes out there in the world of watercolor. But what I'm sharing in this video, it reflects my educated opinion and my intuition. I'm sharing thoughts and my experiences on all these palettes. I'm not trying to make any direct accusations. I've got a couple of controversial things I'm going to reveal, but they aren't necessarily accusations. And I'm not here saying that I've got it all figured out and I've got the inside track on all these brands. No, no manufacturer paid me for any of these reviews, friends. Uh, I had a few palettes here that were given to me free, offered in exchange for an honest and open review. And that's the Paul Rubens, Arteza, and Etcher. And stick around because I'm going to be revealing the nine other palettes I will be talking about today. And last and certainly not least, I am reviewing my own palette, my Paint Crush Art for Joy's Sake palette, which is mine. I'm the designer of. 
And I'm certainly going to give my best take at an open, honest, and unbiased review, but let's face it, I'm inherently biased on that one. Here are my review standards. Tinting strength, personality and variety of the palette, color range, ability to glaze well, lifting and staining, dispersion, overall clarity, and je ne sais quoi. Now, does the palette have something that you just can't explain but just makes it stand out? And the brands I'm reviewing, here we go. Paul Rubin's Gemstone series, Arteza, Tubes, Derwent Ink Tents, Etcher, Paint Crush, Gonze Tombi, Rosa Gallery, Lucas, Shinhan SWC, Tints, Mission Gold, and Phoenix. And here's just a few buzzwords that will be helpful for you to understand moving forward. Paint versus pigment. Sometimes they're used interchangeably, but they're not the same thing. Pigment is the raw natural substance that is combined with binders to create the paint. Optical brighteners. This is something that gets talked about a lot when you dig a little deeper into the watercolor world. Many of the palettes reviewed here likely use them, that's my guess, but it's not all bad. Optical brighteners are often added to paint to make colors more bright and exciting in the packaging at first glance and on paper. So is it just a marketing ploy? Sometimes. Optical brighteners aren't always bad depending on the amount of brightener used, but when brighteners are bad, you know it. And here's how you know it. When the paint dries, it's chalky and dull. Very different kind of dull chalkiness from a semi-transparent or opaque or semi-opaque watercolor. The brighteners can actually reduce the dry time of the paint, which is a no bueno for watercolor. And it can be really difficult to build up contrast. And in general, if optical brighteners are being used irresponsibly in a formulation, the paint in general is just not going to act like you would expect watercolor to act. Single pigment paints versus multi-pigment formulations. Paint made from a single pigment offers more reliably repeatable mixes. These are often recommended for beginners, but under the assumption that color mixing is where beginners should start. Many swear by a small palette of single pigment colors, very specific choices, and they encourage beginners to learn color mixing right from the get-go. But color mixing doesn't bring everyone joy. And it can be extremely overwhelming for many just starting out. Now, multi-pigment paints or convenience colors are just as they sound. It's paint mixed from various pigments in one formula, AKA convenience colors, gorgeous and ready to go. All of the palettes featured today have examples of multi-pigment formulations. Some of them have single pigments too, but I just want you to know what we're dealing with. All in all, friends, you know yourself best. If color mixing sounds just like scary and it makes you just want to stop and freeze and not do anything, then I want you to lean more in the convenience color direction when you're choosing your level up palette. Because remember, we're all about following the joy. I know this has been a lot of actual technical stuff so far, friends, but if you found it interesting along the way and you're still with me, go ahead and give this video a boop. That's a like, friends, and it really helps out my channel. And I will say this, if you have anything to add to this conversation, go ahead, head into comments because the comment section can be such a treasure trove of knowledge and experience. A word about professional watercolors. What distinguishes a professional paint from student grade is fillers. Professional paint basically has a higher pigment load and less fillers. However, the presence of a more opaque feel in watercolors can often be misrepresented as that dreaded chalky or full of filler type paint when that isn't always the case. With very affordable palettes, it often is the case, but these palettes have given opaque watercolor a bad name. Not all watercolor is made from pigments that produce a sheer effect or finish on the page. Some of the most beloved single pigment paints are naturally more opaque, but this doesn't make them any less professional or quality. Many convenience colors are made from multiple pigments, especially with the inclusion of white. And of course, that will make the paint more opaque, but not necessarily poor quality. 
All in all, it's just really good to know that watercolor is a faceted medium. It has a lot of different faces and personality types. And I think that is freaking exciting. Tinting strength versus pigment load. They're related, but not quite the same thing. Without getting too scientific, have you ever kind of sprayed down a new palette and started kind of activating that color and you just felt like you had to keep digging and digging and digging to get any kind of strength of color on your brush? That pigment used in that formulation was likely of low tinting strength. So the colors that really release themselves quickly and in a juicy way, those pigments used are likely of a high tinting strength. Pigment load is just how much actual pigment is in a formulation versus how much filler or additives. And dispersion. You know, when you put brush to wet paper and the color kind of bursts into the page. Well, not all natural pigments when made into a paint disperse as much as others, but lower quality paints with some odd or too plentiful of a filler may actually impede a pigment's ability to disperse correctly. So it's a fine line. Glazing. So for this video, I'm looking at glazing as kind of a way to understand which palettes might be using more fillers or optical brighteners or anything that might be affecting the quality of the paint. Because a glaze, a really beautiful luminous glaze, is best done with a paint that has amazing clarity and isn't opaque. Nothing wrong with opaque colors. Remember, you can always use them in glazing, just lay them down on the paper first and glaze over top of them. And one final thing, before we get into the real exciting part of this, the reviews, I want to say a word about those big watercolor palettes. You know the ones I'm talking about. It's super easy to get lured into grabbing one of these big, colorful palettes filled with half pans that look like candy rainbows. I get it. I've made my life's passion out of collecting hundreds of paint pans that I could easily mix because I just like the experience. But I say beware at this stage. Beware of those type of palettes. Let me show you why. I grabbed two of the largest palettes from the collection I'll be reviewing today. I started color mixing, swatching them, making charts. One features 24 colors, the other 48. What I immediately noticed about the mixing charts were the thick strips of color appearing that seemed to be so similar. And those strips of brown and green and blue and dark muddy reds appeared again and again. And I just started these mixing charts. One explanation, and I'd argue the most important explanation, is that too many colors in these larger palettes are simply too similar to one another to be super useful in everyday painting. I compared these two just begun charts with a 12 color palette. And as you can see, the carefully curated set of just 12 colors can give the same variety as a week selection of 24 or even 48. First up, we have the Paul Rubens Gemstone. Currently on Amazon, this is $42.99 for 24 half pans. Okay, it's got a glittery Euro style tin. I'm in love. It's fun. I love Euro style tins, but I don't find them any more functional necessarily. The packaging feels pricey, and I know from experience, fancy packaging just adds price and not much value or any value. Fabric bag, the luxe foil box, half pans are wrapped. I suspect that this allows this particular palette from this manufacturer just to be priced up a bit because honestly there isn't much difference between this Paul Rubens and previous generations except for the fact that they're using some non-toxic pigments compared to past versions of this palette. Very disappointing violet here, slimy texture, low pigment load. I felt like I had to keep digging and digging to get anything out of it. The palette is otherwise very richly pigmented. I suspect optical brighteners but they aren't impacting the paint quality after I inspected everything when it was dry. Beautiful transparency, but only one opaque option, which leaves me wanting. Their Naples yellow is lovely. It's super opaque, but it's not a traditional Naples, but whatever. Burnt umber feels weird, unpredictably gritty, almost like a poor attempt at simulating granulation. Really nice dispersion on this palette, especially when the page is super wet. As I expected, I've used Paul Rubens before, and this new generation of palette is no different from the past quality. 
my wash test on this one was was nice it wasn't quite as nice as i expected but that's probably because i used a really opaque pigment for one of the three options but overall they melted into each other nicely and made pretty easy work of creating an even wash i want to add to here that the clarity of these paints when they are dry is lovely there's no sense of chalkiness even at mass tone so i'm really really happy with that Wow, we're just getting into this, friends. I gotta know, though, are you having a good time? It's been a ton of information. Let me know in comments that you're still with me or you're like, whoa, Christy, I'm overwhelmed. I wanna hear about it. Get the conversation started down below, friends. And while you're at it, if you are having fun and you feel so inclined, go ahead and give this video a boop. That's a like, friends, and it really helps others find this channel and this information. My glazing test on the Rubens palette. Beautiful, lovely, clean glazing capability, just exactly what I would expect. Overall, friends, this is one of my top picks, honestly. And although I do think you're paying a little bit more a premium for really fancy packaging and that palette style, I do wish there was more of a variety of the personalities of watercolor, being there's only one opaque and everything else is really sheer, but some of you might really like that. You just can't go wrong here. Next up is Arteza. Right now on Amazon, it's $37.60 for 60 tubes. I'm always underwhelmed by Arteza packaging, but at least I know I'm not paying a premium for anything fancy. The tube paint feels far superior to pans I've tried in the past, but the tube paint doesn't cure reliably, so you can build your own half pans, and that's kind of a bummer. Honestly, the paint feels well pigmented, but it does have a curious, slightly slippery texture straight out of the tube. Lovely color variety, obviously 60 tubes, because that large set is full of different personalities from sheer to opaque, and even some of those pastel convenience colors as well. Some of the colors though are so similar, they feel almost like a repeat, and I'm not sure how helpful they are. I was pleased with the clarity of the colors in my set of 12 for sure. Arteza in general seems to have decent quality, but I've been wowed by other brands for a similar price. Dispersion with Arteza was definitely a letdown. The color really didn't move, whether or not the paper was wet or damp or super wet. So yeah, my wash test was a little frustrating. I felt like I had to work really hard to get a nice smooth transition between each of the colors and in general, an overall even wash. And I was eventually able to get it, but it shouldn't have been that difficult. On the glazing front, Arteza actually shocked me and did really well. With glazing, you wanna kinda of get that glow, that magical kind of vibe. And honestly, even when I applied a little bit of a heavier green over top of a lighter yellow, I still was able to get that nice, distinct glow. Good job, Arteza. Overall, for the price, I'd prefer a little bit better quality, a definitely more curated, exciting collection of colors. Arteza, though, is a fine quality, except for the whole dispersion thing, but there are things you can do to improve that. It's great for a classic approach to watercolor, and they've got good reviews and a loyal following. Next up, we have Derwent Ink Tents. They are $39.99 right now on Amazon for 24 half pans. In some ways, these aren't actually watercolors. Direct from the Derwent site, Ink Tents paints are intensely vibrant, water soluble, layer well, and dry permanently, unlike traditional watercolor. Hmm, interesting. Let's get into it. I was really excited about these. A really lovely color variety when you first look at the palette. Exciting to know and then experience that the color is permanent, meaning their light fastness when dry. Awesome. I was concerned at first, like, would I be able to actually do any lifting with these? Because whatever's making these pigments permanent, no matter what, is it going to kind of affect the lifting capability? But that actually wasn't the case. I have a feeling there's an overuse of optical brighteners with these, because here's the thing, and it's only a suspicion. There's major fading when these dry. And even when you look close, there seems to be like a whitish haze kind of rising to the surface. It's definitely chalky and it's the most chalky of any of the brands I'm reviewing today, which is a massive bummer. And it's definitely chalkiness. It's not an opaque vibe. Because remember, these are supposed to be like super vibrant and layer well, according to Derwent. So hmm, 
I was actually really surprised with the dispersion on these. I thought they would act a lot like inks or watercolor, like liquid watercolor, but they didn't. They really didn't want to move that much. The blue actually moved a bit more than the others, but I think that was maybe just the nature of the pigments used in the formulation friends. So yeah, if you're expecting these to move, which I certainly was, uh, yeah, not happening wash test was fabulous these kind of melted together in a beautiful effortless way and with my glazing experiment i think what they said on their website was really correct they definitely layered together beautifully there was definitely kind of that maintaining of a luminosity between the two layers with the glazing test not as good as rubens but close Overall, I really wanted to love this palette. As I do, they're ink tents and graph tint lines so much, but these pigments feel like they could be an example of what goes wrong when optical brighteners are overused. Again, that's just conjecture. The wet color is exciting, but quickly fades dramatically, leaving me feel as if I could use this set for a little more than underpainting in my mixed media work. We are moving on to Etcher. Right now on Amazon, it's $50 for 24 pans. Friends, you get this pretty basic, but completely lovely and functional mobile half pan or full pan palette, however you wanna use it. And honestly, I was excited about this set. It's got a good color variety, even though it's missing a really solid pink magenta. You know me, I'm a sucker for a good pink in every palette. I love the color intensity. These re-wet very easily and they just seem super vibrant. It, but then things got a little weird when I let everything dry and that was something I was looking at specifically. I'm definitely suspecting, just remember, suspecting optical brighteners as part of the paint formulation uh, because the paint really is doing some weird things that I wouldn't expect. There's of course some chalkiness when everything's dry, especially near or at mass tone. There's an odd sheen also as you layer up the paint and it just handles in a very strange way. At times it does what you think it should do and at times then it acts just completely strange and you're not sure what's going on. Now on to my test for dispersion. I I just, I literally, my notes say no. I only tried four or five of the 24 colors, but I just got a feel for this dispersion and it just wasn't happening. This was another reason I'm suspecting either some particular filler uh, that is making these paints not want to move and groove like they normally would, or of course the optical brightener, because these do look really bright in the pan, and that is one of the telltale signs, along with the odd chalkiness, and then especially add on to that, the weird handling and the way the paint is just kind of feeling underhand. Now, when you shear this paint down, it does beautifully, it washes really well, easy, easy to obtain smooth transition. So it does really well when it's sheared out. I, I, I just, it's, it's kind of a marvel to me. I can't imagine why it does so well at sheer and not so well at anything else. If you have any ideas, go ahead and let us know in comments. Uh, certainly educate us. Um, glazing was actually nice, which kind of makes sense because glazing is all about luminosity and luminosity happens when the clarity of the paint formulation is really high. So glazing, thumbs up. Overall, with Paul Rubens being in the mix of this review, it's really hard for me to recommend this particular palette. While the packaging quality and pigment load of this palette draws you in, the dried paint finish is entirely too odd, the handling is too unpredictable, and it's just really hard to create consistent results. I'm sorry, Etcher, but we love, love, love your watercolor sketchbooks. Next up, we have Paint Crush. It's $42 for 12 half pans currently on Amazon. Friends, yes, this is one of the more pricey palettes out there in the mid-range category. Palette features a custom pattern, so you're definitely paying a bit more for that innovation and collectability. Now, this set also comes with private access to a one-hour class that you can only get with the purchase of the palette. And I've yet to see that on any other Amazon palettes. The paint re-wets effortlessly. Just a touch of a wet brush and you can produce vibrant brush strokes. Out of the 12 colors, seven are classically sheer, three are quite opaque, and two are close to what I traditionally label semi-transparent. 
one of them is also somewhat granulating. So it has a fantastic variety in terms of watercolor personality. The color selection at first seems odd. I'll be the first one to admit it, you know, because I designed it. And it definitely could use an addition of a Payne's Gray or an Indigo. But what you can make from this palette is impressive. The sheer colors disperse like some inks I've used, which I love and was something I had to have in my palette. I told you guys I'm biased. Even the semi-transparent and opaque paints in this set sheer down beautifully without appearing chalky. My dispersion tests on this one, these paints move and groove like some inks even. Now the more opaque varieties, they still move, but not quite as much, but that's to be expected. My wash tests went well on these. They melted together beautifully as expected. It's a little more tricky when you bring in the opaque paint in this set versus all the shears, but beautiful washes. All right, I'm gonna break up this fun because this is the palette that I created and I wanna be fair. So friends, if you agree or disagree, if you own this particular palette and you wanna get your thoughts down, get down into comments and let us know. Go ahead, be honest, I'm here for it. My glazing tests here, I used one of the more opaque greens. So this particular glazing can't stand up to say Rubens, but there still is a good sense of luminosity, especially see it there in the upper part of the leaf. The addition of the fluorescent yellow though in this set, makes sure that you can create tons of luminosity and beautiful glowy effects with any of the paints in this set, even if they are more opaque. Overall, I designed this palette to be delightfully surprising and shockingly versatile, and I think I did an okay job at it. You can mix a ton of really innovative colors with this palette and also have a sense of the classics as well. And while there is a good presence of opaque watercolor here, nothing is even coming close to a chalky feeling. This is a fantastic option for a high quality level up palette, especially if your first palette with watercolor was more traditional. You knew I had to include Gonzi Tambay by Kiratake. It is currently $40 for 36 large but shallow pans on Amazon. It has curious packaging that feels like it could be driving up the price unnecessarily, especially since the packaging doesn't really add any functional value. There's no mixing tray, which is definitely odd for such a large palette. These are intensely pigmented, but they're made differently for Japanese style painting. It's a glue binder instead of gum Arabic. It dries with a noticeable sheen, especially at mass tone. It never feels chalky necessarily, but there is a strong opacity with every single one of these paints in the set. And I love this, it includes a few shimmery options, which is always super fun. One thing to know if you're like me, I was never too thrilled with the longevity of this palette and the mobility of it. So of course it's big, but those pans are loose. You drop this bad boy and you're done so. They also crack really easily when they do drop. And over time, the paint overall seems to shrink in the pans and then kind of releases itself from the pan and cracks even more. If you don't travel a lot, it might not be a big deal, but definitely worth noting. There's not much to say here, but these disperse beautifully. My wash test went really nicely. These sheared down great. Surprising actually, because I know they're opaque. It was difficult though to get the smooth transitions compared to other brands. And I have a feeling that has to do with either the binder or the opacity or a combination of both. But remember, I'm no paint scientist. Now in terms of glazing, and this is not a shock, this is a limitation of the style of paint and how it's made. These are not great for glazing. They're designed for single layer use. And that is actually because that's how Japanese watercolors are traditionally used. So I can't hold that against this palette, not at all. But it's definitely something good to know if you like a lot of detail and a lot of layers. Overall, okay, I used to recommend this palette for beginners often because of the quality and the pigment load and the price, but I no longer can. This is a fun, high quality set to paint with but it handles very differently than traditional watercolor. And that can be unnecessarily frustrating, especially in the earlier years of your watercolor journey. 
I now recommend this set when you're well into your collection and looking to try a new style of watercolor paint. Okay, it's time. We're about halfway through, friends, and I'm so glad you're still here with me, but I've got to know which of these palettes so far is your favorite and why. You've got to let us know in comments. Head down now. And if you are just feeling like this is just a crazy video and full of information that you're finding useful, go ahead and give this video a boop. That's a like. All right, Rosa Gallery. These are made in Ukraine currently right now on Amazon, $58.99 for 21 full pans. Friends, these have a bold, intense pigment load. The tinting strength is off the charts. Classic color and personality. Could definitely use a few more exciting convenience colors, but if you buy the right set, make sure you get kind of a bright pink. They have an opera rose, you'll be good to go. Lots of fun movement with these. These are traveling around on the paper like you would expect a full-blown professional watercolor to. And actually this is considered their professional line, but the pricing like makes you scratch your head because you're like, wait, wait, they're just too, too affordable. They feel quite similar in ways to Windsor & Newton Professional, which you all know is one of my favorites. Lots of traditional sheer watercoloriness here. So I'm not seeing a variety of opacity. So that is definitely kind of a little bit of a thumbs down for me. Dispersion here, as you would expect, fantastic, fantastic. Love how they move on the paper. My wash test here was a little surprising. I expected these to perform really effortlessly. And they didn't. And to be quite honest, friends, I can't figure out why. If you have any ideas, maybe it's just user error, to be quite honest. Maybe it's too much water. But I'd love to hear about it in comments. But yeah, the yeah, the wash, I don't know. I'm not I'm not sure what's happening there, but I still love these. My glazing test was also a bit of a quandary because I was expecting a little bit more luminosity to be able to see some of that yellow, the brush stroke, the unevenness kind of shining through the green. And I didn't, the green on top of that yellow felt a little opaque, even though it wasn't an opaque or even a slightly opaque pigment. So interesting. My glazing test revealed that when I applied that second layer, that green leaf, it almost immediately mixed with the yellow and kind of just was like I was mixing paint on paper, which is not really the point of glazing. So it makes me think that maybe these aren't the best for glazing, but I'd have to definitely do some more experiments. I did poke around on the internets and I know some other artists who have tested these kind of feel the same way, so there's something there. Overall, this is a very well done professional quality at a really good price. Ensure whichever set you invest in has a few good pinks. There are a ton of different sets. I believe there are 60 colors overall in the range. It's not the best choice for someone looking to experiment with the many faces of watercolor though or any unique convenience colors. Next up, we have Lucas Watercolors. All right, let's get into it. Friends, this brand I was really excited about. I've had these for a while and I've used them here and there for a while. They honestly re-wet beautifully. I mean, you can just touch a damp brush and you're good to go and you've got these gorgeous saturated strokes. There's just beautiful intensity. So the tinting strength seems to be just fantastic. And they move around on the page too. I know I'm getting ahead of myself with all of my tests, but friends, I gotta tell ya, these dry chalky. And at first I was like, okay, okay, all paints, all watercolors have that shift that happens when they go from wet to dry. There's always a little bit of a loss of intensity, right? No, I'm suspecting something more is at play here. And I think it might be the poor use of optical brighteners. I can't know that for sure. I'm still doing research on that. If you know, certainly comment below. And here's why. When totally dry, I noticed kind of a chalkiness, a residue kind of coming to the surface of the paper, especially noticeable on the browns in the set that I had. And uh, yeah, it was just it, no bueno. So like I said, dispersion was good. It was definitely good. And as you can see on the page with some of my swatching, you know, there was some cool effects going on. I might even go as far as saying maybe there's some granulation going on here, but still all that chalkiness rising to the top, I, I can't. My wash test, it was very difficult to create a smooth wash. It dried sheer once I got the wash to kind of do what I wanted it to do. Uh, but yeah, struggle bus. 
All right, and glazing, as you would expect, cat's out of the bag with this one. I honestly believe the glazing on the Lucas was the worst performer. I mean, it wasn't, I'll say this, none of the palettes that I review here today performed horribly when it came to glazing, but Lucas was definitely bottom. Now I think you know where I'm heading here overall, friends. This one is just a, a no-go for me. Uh, there's so many, so many better options out there for the same, similar price or even more affordable. So this one is, yeah, off the table. Okay, now with all of that said, I feel so bad. I have, I have such guilty feelings. Friends, if you disagree with me or you think that maybe I misunderstood kind of some of the results that I was getting on any of these palettes, I welcome the open and honest dialogue. So go ahead and get into comments. If you think I'm doing a good job and these reviews could potentially be helpful when you are navigating your next Amazon buying frenzy, then go ahead and give this video a boop. That's a like, friends, and it really helps my channel out, so thank you. Next up is Shinhan SWC, and that is a very specific and important distinction because there's a lot of different palettes made by Shinhan, and I don't know all of the ins and outs of it, but it's important to know that there's a lot going on with this brand. Okay, these are $30.50 currently right now for 12 tubes. These are the tints. Each of these tubes has a pigment or two pigments mixed with white. It's PW6 in this case. It's curious though, because I don't feel like it's a fully like pastel palette. I can't with good conscience call this pastel. Excellent tinting strength though. I couldn't believe the power of the pigments that were coming out of this because these are mixed with a lot of white. So a lot of opacity, you wouldn't expect a lot of color too. They're just very curious, very fun. No chalkiness, even though these are super opaque. There's definitely a difference between chalkiness in watercolor and opaque watercolor. And if friends, if there's someone here that can describe that difference better than me, by all means. I kind of feel like opaque watercolor still has kind of a luminosity to it that a chalky watercolor just doesn't. All right, my dispersion tests. It, it definitely had more dispersion than I expected given that these all have white in the formulation. So that was awesome. My wash test, beautiful, creamy, lovely, velvety, smooth transitions, awesome. And easy to accomplish those transitions. Okay, here, here is the shocker. Typically, opaque pigments are really not the best option for glazing, but somehow, the magic of Shinhan, these are. Th this combination that I have here in my experiment, beautiful glazing. I'm shocked, I'm blown away, I'm pretty excited about it. Overall, gorgeous paints, very impressive. This particular set is absolutely a convenient set. So really, I wanna recommend this for someone who has quite a few palettes under their belt and maybe just wants something super duper fun and a little bit trendy. I need to say this though. I can imagine that the full range of Shinhan SWC is impressive. Mission Gold, one of my favorite brands of all time, and, but things got weird. And so, okay, $37 for 12 questionably filled half pans that they're actually calling triple pans, but we'll get into that. Okay, it, this is an odd palette. It has an odd structure, but it's being used heavily as a selling point. I don't know, I'm not buying it. Well, I actually did buy it, but you know what I mean referred to as triple pans, but these are not even full half pans. So I, I don't get it. They're like, literally, it's like a little smiley face. The, the fill is completely concave. So uh, not, not, not loving that. Really good tinting strength, as I would expect with Mission Gold. Just a really classic variety of colors in this palette. Uh, no opaques, they all are pretty sheer. So it's kind of like a mm, mm, little ho-hum in terms of variety. But I will say this, friends, I know Mission Gold has a ton of gorgeous, opaque, convenience colors, all the things. So if you pick the right set, we'll be in much better shape in that department. Okay, here's where it gets weird. Well, actually it's been weird the whole time. I'm shocked by this palette. 10 out of the 12 colors in this palette are drying suspiciously chalky, which is shocking for Mission Gold because like one of their things is clarity. That's what I've always loved about Mission Gold, ex of course, except for like convenience pastel colors. In my research of this particular palette, I ran into some very current 
reviews of Mission Gold in general. And there's just some stuff lying around out there kind of suggesting that maybe their formulation overall has changed and the quality has actually decreased, which really bums me out and I kind of need to explore that more. But this particular palette definitely feels weird like that. Nice dispersion on these. These are moving around really nicely. Not like inks and some of the other watercolor palettes in this review that really rocked and rolled on the page, but they're doing an okay job. The wash test was surprising based on my past experience with Mission Gold. It was definitely more difficult and I got a streaky result with this one. So that was super weird too. Glazing with this one, just fine as expected. Nothing surprising here. Overall, Mission has always been a favorite of mine, but this particular palette has me completely scratching my head. I've always made half pan palettes from their tubes, so perhaps there is a difference based on the fact that these are pre-made half pans. Uh, but based on the fact that other artists are reviewing the newer formulation in a similar kind of scratch your head kind of way, it has me concerned. More research is definitely needed, so hold off on this one is my recommendation. Next up is Phoenix, and a couple of you recommended me taking a look at this brand. Currently $29.99 on Amazon for 24 half pans. Packaging on this one is good. It's a sturdy kind of travel palette, love it, where the half pans snap in. Though, as soon as I got into things, I definitely knew there was an issue. Low tinting strength here for sure on the vast majority of the palette. And remember, that's where you kind of feel like you have to keep digging and rewetting and digging into the palette to get any amount of good color on your brush onto the page. Now, once you get the color on the page, it does have a nice sheer quality to it. It's a good range of colors here, kind of a classic arrangement, but definitely in this particular palette, lacking an exciting pink. So many others similarly priced are far superior in terms of pigment load. So this palette is a big struggle for me to talk about. So dispersion, as you might have guessed, the paint moves moderately well, but isn't at all impressive with such a low pigment load. I'm assuming the issue here is pigment load. And remember, tinting strength and pigment load are related but not the same. So there could be many issues at play here. The wash test, easily streaking with this color, too much work needed to get a smooth-ish finish. Some of the other palettes took a little extra work to get the smooth finish that I was after, but at least I got it. This finish wasn't even that fantastic. The glazing test was a disappointment too, very similar to the Mission Gold and the Lucas. And yeah, it just kind of automatically felt like it was mixing with the layer underneath and all that color was just releasing from the first layer. And yeah, so I didn't feel like that was a great start to the glazing possibilities of this particular palette. Overall, low pigment load, honestly, it's a deal breaker for me. It's just not worth the price considering all of the strong competition at the same or lower price. Now I do have another video. I did it a while back and I talked about some of my favorite Amazon palettes for the beginner. And it's a very different type of review and type of paint that I'm talking about. So if you feel like this is a little bit ahead of where you're at, you might wanna check that one out. I'll link it below. Now I talked about light fastness at the very beginning of this video and basically said overall, all the brands represented here are doing a pretty decent job at capturing collections that have really good light fastness. Now, of course there are outliers and of course there are paints within each of these palettes that have less of a light fast rating. But if you know me for any amount of time, you know that I don't worry about light fastness too much. And here is a way that you can kind of bypass for the most part, not in all cases, but you can pretty well bypass the worries about light fastness. In my experience, the most important aspect of light fastness is protection and prevention. So for example, I store all of my work that is in progress or completed, but not yet matted and framed under UV protected glass. I store that in cabinets that get no direct light exposure. And that basically eliminates any issues. Now, of course, what happens when I go to frame a piece or sell a piece or yeah, you get it. What happens when I take it out of the cabinet? Well, here's the thing. 
I let all of my buyers know that I do use paints that range in terms of light fastness and that we finish all of our paintings with a UV spray protectant. Here's a look at a piece that I'm about to spray. I want you to just soak it in, take a look. I'm capturing all of this footage at the same day, same time, right after one another. Now I'm gonna go ahead and spray this with the UV protectant and I wanna show you that it's not affecting or impacting the look at my piece at all. And this is a UV protectant that I've been using for years. And in my research, trying to find the perfect protectant, I discovered that a lot of watercolor artists like myself are doing just the same thing. Now, it doesn't stop there. We also recommend, highly suggest, that our pieces are framed underneath a UV protected glass. So those UV rays can't get through. And the vast majority of the UV rays are prevented from getting through. With a spray protectant and UV glass, your light fastness worries really need to fade away in my humble opinion. Now, of course, it's an opinion, so go ahead in comments if you have anything you'd like to add to that conversation. It's okay, I'm developing a thick skin here. I can take it, I think. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. All right, friends, last but not least, we are going on to Mungayo. And so many have brought up this palette. Right now on Amazon, it's $39.05 for 48 half pans. It is our largest palette. Okay, first off, love this palette. The tin holds 48 plus paints. You can fill in those channels. This particular palette, now I bought this a couple years ago. You can actually, each little row is separate and you can move them around, which I actually really like instead of it being one big removable tray. So cool. Honestly, this palette, empty, is almost worth the cost of $39. I'll just be honest, let me know if you agree. It's a very large set with a seemingly big variety of color options. And from what I'm seeing and what I know of this palette, it looks like it has a nice variety of, you guessed it, opacity options. And in fact, it does. I'll say this though, the entire range, this entire palette of 48 strongly lends in the opaque direction. And does anybody know the watercolor confections? Now this is purely conjecture, but in my research, in my own kind of tests and studies, I felt there was a strong resemblance between the Mungayo and the watercolor confections. And when I started digging, I noticed that other artists had kind of felt the same. So there is some suspicion that they are both made by the same manufacturer. There is this very common practice, especially with products you're finding on Amazon, where one manufacturer will be supplying a wide variety of different sellers. It's called white labeling, and it's where you take a palette, maybe you change the color of the palette, you switch around the colors in the palette, you put a new logo on it, and you're off and running. For example, my own palette, my Paint Crush palette that I reviewed earlier, is not a white label palette. It is a custom formulation, custom proprietary pigment blends. And so, yeah, I wanted to make sure that what I provided on the market wasn't confusing and wasn't something that somebody might accidentally buy multiple sites just because they thought they were shopping from different brands. All that aside, friends, Mungayo, nice palette. I have some thoughts, obviously, about the size of it. A lot of the colors seem to be very close, redundant in the sense that they're so close that they don't really add too much value in being in there. So I think a lot of the colors in this palette are there for kind of wow factor. Look at this, a 48 color palette for only, right? But let's just say all of the best curated colors of this palette were put together in say a palette of 12 or 15. I love the quality in so many ways of this palette. They re-wet beautifully, they have a velvety texture. The one thing that's off-putting is when you first open the palette, the surface of them has a gritty texture and that gritty texture kind of stays when they reset and re-dry every time. It doesn't seem to impact most of the paints. It's not like you're getting that grit on the paper. My experience is that almost the entirety of this palette is more opaque leaning, and that's kind of odd for watercolor. Usually you're gonna have a nice variety, so the fact that the whole thing is kind of opaque makes me think that the opacity in some of the colors are coming from the overuse of optical brighteners. Dispersion on these is okay, but not thrilling. Now on the other hand, my wash test with the three colors, the ombre was seamless, really easy to accomplish. 
So I was pleased with that. And as you might have suspected, the glazing is just not the best. Anytime a pigment is more opaque or if it's full of fillers or if it has anything going on like fillers, optical brighteners, then it can really impact the opacity of the paint in a negative way. And that can then lead to issues with glazing. But friends, definitely not the worst results in terms of glazing, not at all. Overall, this is a really fun set. I think a smaller variety of the right colors would do just as well. Lots of similar colors here that don't really add to the variety. The texture is odd at times, very unpredictable, and it leans very opaque overall. So if you want that super variety of personality with your watercolor, this wouldn't be on my list. And also, if you're looking for classic sheer watercolor, this is definitely a no-go. Finally, my final thoughts. It's impossible to choose just one because honestly, there's a lot of personalities going on here. And I know there's a lot of personalities going on out there. So I'm super curious though, will your top three picks match mine? Go ahead and pause right now, take a look, remind yourself, and head into comments and let me know what of the 12 are your favorite three. Now, personally, I feel the top three are pretty obvious for three reasons. Number one, they all have a really nice paint personality variety. Number two, their clarity and quality is just stellar. And number three, the overall value. And I didn't pick the most affordable, absolutely not. But in terms of what is offered in the set and that kind of cost to feature benefit ratio, that's what I was looking at. Paul Rubens, Rosa Gallery, and Paint Crush are my top three picks. Let me explain. Choosing your mid-range palette, your next palette is usually about leveling up in some way, whether it be quality, variety, or something else. Trying out artist quality paints, but without having to get a second mortgage on your home is kind of important. You want quality, predictability, you want vibrant, saturated paint formulations, unique, playful colors, assuming your first palette was perhaps lacking in a few of these areas. Rubens offers up a limited personality, but excellent quality that is hard to beat at this price point. And while you might be paying a premium for layers of fancy packaging, the palette doesn't disappoint with this professional quality and super reliable performance. Rosa Gallery is a surprising outlier with standout quality at a significantly affordable price. While this palette won't be the best for the realistic painters among us, you know, those of us who like to layer and layer, there are so many redeeming qualities to balance the scales here. And yes, friends, I'm sure going into this, you had to know I was going to probably choose my own palette, but let me tell you why I think I have good reason. Paint Crush is the bold twin sister of the two palettes above. She has all the fun, but will surprise you with her insight and seriousness at times. Although she's the priciest of the 12 palettes reviewed, the price I think makes sense for those looking for reliable paint quality, vibrant and creative color selection, and a celebration and a, and a chance to experience all the watercolor personalities in one compact palette. And of course, you get a free lesson for me. It's an hour long, can't go wrong. Whew, my goodness, friends, I don't know about you, but I feel like I need a nap after all of that. Good fun, good fun. Thanks for being here, friends. And let me tell you what, if you're curious about the uber, uber fancy, super duper professional paints that I've mentioned throughout this video, watch this one next and I talk a lot about some of my favorites. Until next time, I wish you so much happy painting.